and welcome. It's great to be with you. My name's Tammy Simon. I'm the founder of Sounds True, and it's my joy and honor to welcome you to this special question and answer session about conscious manifestation with Eckhart Tolle. Our team has gathered many, many questions and sifted through them to select some of the most common and compelling questions about conscious manifestation. And I'll be asking those questions to Eckhart in just a few moments. Here at the start of our program, for those of you who are unaware, I want to let you know that Eckhart and his teaching partner, Kim Eng, are creating an in-depth teaching program. It's called the Spiritual Guide to Conscious Manifestation. And it's a four month learning journey that begins at the end of May next year with a four day retreat in Huntington Beach, California. And then following the four day retreat, there's a four month online learning immersion and at home curriculum that follows and right now we're in the process of letting people know about the spiritual guide to conscious manifestation the in-person retreat followed by the four months at home there'll also be a fully virtual version of the program that we'll announce soon and also you can apply for scholarships to attend the program so if you're interested in going even deeper into some of the themes that we'll be starting to explore here in this Q&A session, I encourage you to check out the Spiritual Guide to Conscious Manifestation. You can just click the Learn More button that's under the player page. And with that, Eckhart, shall we, shall we move into the questions? Welcome. Thank you, Tammy. Welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome to the present moment. Before we start, I'd like to mention that you might be hearing a strange pitter-patter in the background, which is due to the heavy rain that's falling here at the moment. It's all part of the live session. Uh, when I speak, you will probably hear it less, but when I stop speaking, you will hear it more clearly, for example, now. All right, Eckhart, shall we, shall we begin? Uh, uh, let's have a little meditative talk and then I will hand it back to you, Tammy, with the first question. Wonderful. At any given moment, part of being present in the moment is what is conventionally called Gratitude or thankfulness, I guess gratitude is a, and thankfulness are the same thing in the English language. Thankfulness is of Germanic origin or Anglo-Saxon and gratitude is of Latin origin, but they mean the same thing. So part of being present is when you're really in the now, almost inevitably, a certain appreciation arises for whatever is manifesting in the now. At this moment, what's manifesting, for example, here in the background is the sound of the rain on the window pane or the external window sills. It kind of amplifies the sound. And that's something to be grateful for because there's it's a life-giving substance. There's lots of trees here, very tall trees. There's actually not, not far from where I'm sitting. Uh, there's the rainforest. It's, uh, it's the 
actually in this area of British Columbia is the, the world's largest temperate rainforest. And it, this, it, this is why we call it rainforest because it loves the water. It rains so much it has created this wonderful vegetation in there for a million years. And so I can be grateful for the sound of the rain instead of feeling it's uh, something to be rejected or complain about. Gratitude arises for the life-giving substance of the water. And this is only one example, whatever arises, when you're really present, you give it attention, whatever manifests naturally, uh, you can, you welcome it. And even if it's something that looks like uh, an obstacle or a hindrance, that can also be welcomed. Life is full of these things that we call challenges. A real challenge always arises in the present moment, and there are other challenges that arise in the mind. A real challenge arises something, an obstacle arises. Uh, and again, there can be a kind of a gratefulness even for that, because you realize that the evolution of consciousness requires obstacles. It requires the rising of a limitation in your life. Because only by encountering limitation do you become motivated to transcend or rise above the limitation. And that requires more consciousness. In some simple cases, it may just require more physical strength. So, but whatever it is, it requires an influx of energy on whatever level, whether it's on the purely physical level or on a more refined level of uh, conscious attention, consciousness itself. So I'm just mentioning this importance whenever you are uh, interested in manifesting, uh, first of all, acknowledge what is already naturally manifesting in this present moment and see if you can come, become friendly with it instead of wanting to eliminate it in order to have something better. That's already an obstacle that arises when you're trying to, when you're creating an obstacle and you're trying to manifest something, but you're, there's an unhappiness at the basis of it. So when we, when we begin to talk about answer the questions, I'm sure I'll come back to that. Uh, it is a very common obstacle that arises and that is a, a dissatisfaction with the present moment, an inability or unwillingness to acknowledge the aliveness of the present moment, no matter what, where it is and what form it takes. Uh, and that becomes a hindrance to, to your ability to uh, manifest uh, powerfully um, because that's ego. Ego lives largely through non-alignment with the present moment that keeps the ego going. But let's go to the first question and then uh, uh, we'll continue talking about uh, this importance of being aligned with the present, present moment and if the, the power resides in the, in the present moment, the power that is available to you to manifest resides in the present moment here and now. This first question, Eckhart, is directly on that point. It's from Jack from Massachusetts who writes in, do you have to be, quote, out of your head, unquote, and totally present in the moment to consciously manifest something? Yes, that's a, a good question. That, uh, um, out of your head, I guess the questioner means by that uh, out of the thinking mind, the uh, head is often used, uh, meaning 
the thinking mind. Um, yes, the foundation for manifesting is to be deeply rooted in the present moment, in, in the dimension of being. Uh, the dimension of being is there when the mind, you, you, you uh, encounter this dimension, you access this dimension. When the thinking mind subsides for a moment, and let's not just talk about it, but actually experience it in this very moment, the possibility for the stream of thinking to subside just for a moment. And yet you remain very conscious of that. And you're not only conscious of the sense perceptions around you, which you acknowledge and perhaps find some a sense of appreciation that we may sometimes call gratitude an appreciation when you become present, an appreciation for whatever surrounds you, even seemingly insignificant little things. They, they're all there, they have, a, they have a certain presence, your sense perceptions. And then the deeper aspect of being rooted in the dimension of being is to sense the presence, like, let's call it your presence, or it's not yours, but just as a pointer, let's for a moment call it your presence. To sense your presence, not your story, which is the personality of a person. Because you know, when you're not thinking, the story disappears. So this, this the, the personality as which you appear most of the time recedes into the background. And what replaces the personality, which is a narrative in your mind, it's a story, that's your personality, all the conditioning of the mind. So when the, you get out of your head, out of your mind, that subsides and what is something else arises. So the, this entity, the personality recedes into the background. And what, what, uh, what arises is a sense of alert presence. And at first you notice it uh, indirectly because you become more conscious, more aware of your surroundings, your sense perceptions, and you acknowledge that and you appreciate that. This is, this is an, indirectly you become aware of the, of the beingness of the present moment. That's the first step. When you, you begin to appreciate whatever the universe has manifested or you have manifested in this moment, that's the world around you that you take in with your sense perceptions, visual, auditory, tactile, whatever it may be. So that is part of becoming present, a, an appreciation of what is. And then the deeper, this is an in, I, we could call that, you become indirectly aware of the power of the present, the beingness of the present moment. And then you become aware of something deeper that is there at the same time. And that is the, the presence itself, without which you could not be aware of anything. The very power of awareness. And that is very still. It is still. So there's no mental noise anymore. This is an alert stillness. Stillness here means absence of the thinking noise, the noise of thought. And what is left is awareness itself. We could call it consciousness also. Consciousness itself. And that stillness is 
consciousness itself. In other words, you become conscious of being conscious. You, you, you know yourself, you know your essence as that consciousness that is much deeper than the person. As that conscious, that conscious awareness or presence, as that you have no past and no future. And as that presence, you have no age. Doesn't matter whether you're 18 years old or 90 years old, that in that that presence is ageless. And also that presence has no gender, man or woman, or any of the other many genders that people are very much concerned with these days. But as that presence that is not male or female, it transcends that. And that is the point of power. That is the very foundation for manifesting anything in this world is you have to go there first and discover in that dimension, here and now, at this very moment, it is possible to let go of thinking, but not to become into some spaced out state or stuff. You're very alert, and you're just present. And then you sense what we call stillness is only one way of pointing to it or speaking about it. It is, of course, more than just st st stillness. Yes, it's a good pointer. But stillness really means the absence of noise, in this case, mental noise. But this presence is not just the absence of something. Yes, it is the absence of all mind objects. It is the absence of all objects that may arise in consciousness because it's the space of consciousness itself. But it's not just the absence, it is an absence of thought and an absence of objects of consciousness. But there's also a powerful presence that is within you. But whether it is within or without is actually hard to say. Because when you sense it within yourself, you can you also sense it is in the, the, the space that surrounds you, what we call space, is also filled with presence. So inner and outer kind of meet become one. And that, that is a very foundation for all spirituality, whether or not you're interested in manifesting or not. I guess if you are 95 years old, perhaps you've lost the in interest. There's not much more that you want to manifest in this world. There's no need, or you might even be younger and feel there's no need to manifest, that's perfectly fine. Or you may be at a stage in your life where the, uh, you feel the universe wants to manifest something through you in this dimension. But it doesn't matter what it is, but that is the, that is the foundation so getting out of your head, as the questioner asked, yes, in that sense, it's important. But when you begin to manifest, then you will use your mind to some extent. You will, for example, 
you may in some people like to visualize something so you begin to use your mind or you may have affirmations which is a controlled use of your mind yes you do get you need first of all you do need to get out of your head as the questioner puts it and then you sense the power of presence once you sense the power of presence if it is your choice to manifest, you want to manifest something, then you may use affirmations. You speak uh, uh, a sentence, a few words that point towards uh, where you want to, whatever you want to manifest. Uh, even a simple thing, I, I'm filled with spiritual power. It's not an egoic statement because power, spiritual power, is not power of the ego. It's not power over other human beings. But by saying I'm filled with spiritual power can actually deepen your ability to sense that power because that is the power of presence. So I'm filled with spiritual power can deepen that. So you use that pointer. Oh. And in between the statements, there's a space of just where you can sense that power itself. It's a wonderful thing. Uh, so you can use your mind. You may have to use your mind to uh, some extent, uh, but it is a focused way of using your mind. And the wonderful thing is that um, that dimension, we, we could call, the, yes, the dimension of presence, of, of being, it's so fulfilling or satisfying to sense that within yourself, that all manifestation, whatever you can manifest out of that becomes of secondary importance. That's another important part of manifesting, this realization. Whatever you want to manifest in this world, people want what they want better, um, more abundance in their life, perhaps material abundance, there's a shortage of money. You want to experience an expansion on this, this, in this dimension, fine. Or they want to find some uh, companion in their life, or they may want better health, or a better way of contributing to this world. To, as the expression goes, to make a difference <laughs> in this world. They want to uh, be a, a, a positive force in this world. That's all, these are all wonderful things. Um, but the, the primary thing is to, to touch that, to not touch just deeper, to access that dimension within yourself and stay rooted in that dimension. Of, of being, of presence, that in itself is so fulfilling that anything you can manifest becomes, the English expression, if, you're, if English is not your native language, I don't know if you've heard the expression, the icing on the cake. <laughs> the icing on the cake is the stuff you put on top of that you have a cake Icing on the cake is the stuff you put on top of the cake, little ornaments and, and to, to make the cake look nice. It's the icing on the cake. But it's not the cake itself is, is more important than the icing on the cake. So, <laughs> um, so the icing on the cake is that the state of the realization of being. That is this. Sorry, that is, that is the cake. <laughs> Uh, the icing is whatever you manifest. Jesus said the same thing. He didn't uh, 
he didn't actually use, he was not familiar with English and the expression icing on the cake didn't exist. I don't know whether they even had cake at that time, but Jesus used the expression, uh, seek only the kingdom of heaven, everything else that you may think you, that you need will be added unto you. Seek only the kingdom of heaven, everything else will be added unto you. It is only an addition, it's not the main thing. So whatever, in, in, well, in this life, whatever you may want to achieve, it's an adding on to the main thing. The main thing is the kingdom of heaven, which is the realization of being, the realization of, of that which transcends the person or the personality, the realization of being is the I am, without adding anything to it, presence itself. And so then uh, that's the foundation for all manifestation. Then out of that power, you maybe some people like to visualize the situation. Others may want to use verbal affirmations, and that's fine. But as you use those things, you stay connected with that dimension. So and that means when you want something in life, uh, the wanting is very different from the egoic wanting because you no longer, you don't need it to be fulfilled or happy. So it's the different kind of wanting. You don't need it to be fulfilled. The fulfillment you have to find in the present moment. You can't, you have to go deep enough into the present moment. So you find, and again, quoting Jesus again, because he talked about it. In the present moment, you find what he called the fullness of life. That's actually an expression that Jesus used. He said, I want you to have the fullness of life. In some translations, it's called abundant life. I want you to have abundant life. In other translations, it's I want you to have the fullness of life. And that fullness of life does not mean many things. It means that the essence of life itself, that is the fullness of life. Then all those things that you may want will be added, well, maybe not all of them, but many of things will be added unto you. <clears throat> so that's, that is the, uh, the essence of, of uh, manifestation. Um, we will talk about some other aspects as I answer some more questions. This question, Eckhart, comes from Vibka from Barcelona, Spain, who writes in, thank you very much, Eckhart, for sharing your wisdom with us. Why is it sometimes super easy for me to manifest? and it arrives in no time. And then other times, it doesn't seem to work at all. Does it have to do somehow with me not fully letting go of wanting it or believing that I already have it, am it? Thank you. Right, well, another good question. <laughs> So first of all, congratulations that you're already uh, quite successful in manifesting quite often. And um, sometimes, yes, you're right, sometimes uh, it may not appear or it may also appear after a much longer time gap than you might have expected. So certain things appear 
when you almost forget that you uh, attempted to manifest these things, let's say you spent a, a couple of weeks or three weeks repeating certain affirmations and visualizing it, and then after a while it's good to let go, to, uh, give it some space, and then nothing happens. And it could be that a year later, the very thing you almost forgot that you you, you, you practice this manifestation uh, method in order to uh, uh, manifest this or that. And a year later, it suddenly appears and you remember, oh, that's what I um, worked on a year ago to manifest and I've almost forgotten about it. That can happen. Uh, but other things can happen too, and that is there could be too much wanting. The wanting can be an obstacle. If you want some, if you want it too much, that implies you're not sufficiently rooted in the power of presence. And then the wanting takes over. And if, if there's too much wanting, by implication, uh, you are saying that you don't have it. So in that kind of wanting, this is sometimes people try to exercise willpower when they try to manifest what they, I really, I, I'm going to, I, I really want, I want this, whatever it is. That is not necessarily a good way to manifest uh, because by saying I want it, you're also saying that you don't have it yet. But the most powerful way to manifest is the feeling that you already, that it's already here. And that it only arise out of the fullness of being, of presence in the present moment, because then you merge the image of what you want with a sense of fullness, the fullness of being. So the, the image and the fullness of being come together. And that is a powerful way of manifesting it, which means you don't, you don't need that thing for your happiness anymore. You don't need it for your ultimate fulfillment. The most powerful way to manifest is to regard it as a, a play or a game, the game of life, the play of life, uh, of manifesting then that's also a sense of detachment from the outcome, uh, an excessive attachment to the desired outcome is also an obstacle to manifesting. Uh, if you desperately need something, if you are unhappy, if, if you are unhappy when you, if you don't get it, then there's something wrong. So if you're unhappy, when you don't achieve whatever you want to manifest, then that you, you didn't do it right. <laughs> uh, so there needs to be a, detachment, so to speak, from the desired outcome so that you don't project this, uh, whatever you want to manifest doesn't become a future projection, but whatever you want to manifest needs to be realized as already existing on some level in the unmanifested. That's why Jesus said, I always go back to Jesus because whatever you want to learn about manifestation, just read, read what he's, he explained it all in very simple words. He said, whenever you pray for something, uh, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. That's the, the entire secret of manifestation right there. And the, part, the, the importance of the words are not believe that you will receive it. <laughs> because then there would be too much wanting. I want this, I will get it. No, he said, 
believe that you have received it and it will be yours and it will be given to you. So the point, believing that you have, to, in other words, you already, it's already there. And you can, when you, and how does that happen? How does it happen when you know, when your senses tell you that it's not there? Let's say you live in a, you live in a trailer. There's nothing wrong with living in a trailer. It's the one, I love trailers. But let's say you live in a trailer, but you want a nice house. Okay, your preference would be a nice house, but are you, are you unhappy in your trailer or are you, you appreciate being in a trailer? And you can hear the pitter patter of rain on the roof. Uh, well, I can hear it now, I'm not in a trailer, and I can still hear it from the window pane. Uh, so in a trailer, but you want a nice house. Okay, where is the house? Well, of course, you look around, it's not here. I'm living in it. Are you creating some kind of dissatisfaction by telling yourself a story? This is what my life has come to. I'm reduced to living in a trailer. I need to get out of here. These are, this, this is all disempowering, all those narratives, telling yourself stories that are not good enough, all very disempowering. You're, yes, your senses are telling you that you, you're not living in a nice house, you're just in a trailer, but that's for, I'm fine for the present moment. So where's the house? The house is in your imagination in your mind you can you, maybe you visualize it or maybe you have certain verbal affirmations that you have a lovely house that you live in and then the the visualization and the verbal affirmation uh, you bring it together allow the, allow the visualization or the verbal affirmation to be empowered by that sense of presence. So the, it meets the presence. So that heart, that, that house merges with the sense of presence. And then it, inside you feel you already have it. And the weird thing is when you finally, when you do get it, let's say next year or in six months time or in two years time or in three years time, when you do get it, the nice, and then suddenly you sit in your nice house. It makes no difference to your inner state anymore because when you were in your trailer, you were already in the same state of fullness of life when you're in the nice house. And here you sit in a nice house and say, okay, it's fine. But you're not, you say, yes, a certain amount of satisfaction may be there, but Basically, your inner state is the same as it was before. It was before because you already touched the full. You were already rooted in the in the beingness, the dimension of being, the fullness of life. In other words, when it found it, when well, when it does manifest, uh, you 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 uh, you don't suddenly become oh, I'm so happy, I got it oh. Finally, I don't, no, it doesn't happen anymore. You say, oh, it's good. But your inner state is not, it's the same as it was before. <laughs> no matter what you achieve, you, you, you already have the, the foundation for everything. You're already rooted in that. <laughs> this is why Jesus called it, all these things will be added unto you. It's no more than that and adding, or use the expression, icing on the cake uh, uh, and when you, there's a, you have an enormous sense of freedom of liberation because you're no longer your inner state is no longer dependent on external conditions you are you uh, there's something that in you that is more powerful than any external condition. It's not the inner state is not determined by external conditions anymore. Um, and that's that's very very different from the, uh, 
when you achieve something, um, as I said, a certain amount of satisfaction may be there, but you did not need it for your fulfillment or happiness. You didn't need it for that because that you already, you already found that. Uh, so let's go on to the next uh, question. Eckhart, this is from Samantha in Tampa, Florida, who writes in, I understand that conscious manifestation means that I operate from a sense of the fullness of being. And yet the truth is, I feel a sense of lack in certain areas of my life. And in particular, with my finances, I can sit quietly and feel content and still. But then when I re-engage with my life and especially my banking details, the feeling of lack returns. How do you advise that I work with this sense of lack when it comes to the practice of conscious manifestation? Right, yes, another interesting question. <clears throat> uh, the sense of lack, of course, um, is inseparable from the human ego. The human ego always operates on the basis of lack, whether it's financial lack or other kinds of lack. There's all in the human ego, there's always a sense of there's something missing here. And if you're wealthy, it probably won't be in the region of if you have if you have a few million dollars, maybe you the sense of lack uh, will come from somewhere else. It may not come from finances. It may come from something else. It's something very important that's missing in my life. Uh, many people who are experiencing financial uh, restrictions uh, were not experiencing uh, that abundance, certain abundance that comes to, with, with having sufficient uh, financial funds in their life or income, they may believe that when, when they finally get enough, get this abundance in their lives, then everything will be okay. But that's probably not the case because the ego will still be there and you will sense that lack in other areas of, their of your life, whether it's a lack of um, a partner or companionship or the lack of, of finding the inability to find any kind of real satisfaction in any experience, no matter what you do and where you go, there's always an emptiness that you feel. So I've met many wealthy people over the years and many, some were able to, uh, at least to some extent, go beyond ego and go beyond the sense of lack. But in others, I found a very, a very wealthy people in a very deep sense of lack, sometimes deeper than in some people who had very little money. Uh, and this, and then this sense of, sense of something not right something is missing and, and often they don't they don't even know what it is and then they want to fill it up sometimes with drugs or a desperate search for experiences for sensory experiences maybe a desperate search for uh, or, uh, needing to whatever experience sex sexuality or to, to, in in taking in substances or eating or substances. And I need this, I need that. All of this neediness that's part of the ego and always looking for the next thing to, to fill that void that they feel. And so this void that they feel is part of the ego. 
<clears throat> but um, so let's come back to the question of finances. It, it is an in, the sense of lack is an inseparable part of the ego. That is true. But of course, when you when you have uh, shortage of money uh, that you, uh, restricts your life, so you can't you kind of can't live where you want would like to live, or you, you, there's not enough freedom of movement because there's not enough money. Uh, there is a sense of something missing, and you see it's not just in your mind. It's also here when you look at your bank statement, you see uh, it's not very much there. Uh, going beyond the sense of lack that is an inseparable part of the ego, uh, you need to, I believe the questioner to some extent has already done that, you need to discover uh, the fullness of life, to use Jesus' expression, which is the fullness of being, which is inseparable from the present moment. So when you go there, you can sense, feel that, that abundant, another expression is abundant life that Jesus used. You, you can sense the, uh, this abundant life in the present moment, uh, regardless of whether there is actual abundance uh, in this manifested dimension, you feel the abundance of life and you see, and, and then you, when you appreciate uh, all the countless manifestations of life that are around you, that you, that you um, uh, perceive with your senses, uh, and you acknowledge the abundance of life, that no matter whether that you go out into nature, you see the abundance of nature, uh, the abundance of rain right now that's coming down here that I can hear. Uh, you, there's an acknowledgement, an appreciation, that even a potted plant, I mean, they have a potted plant there and there's another one here, uh, to appreciate that the, the, they are manifestations of the aliveness of the universe. And there's an abundance in everything. If you live in a city, there's an abundance everywhere. You can look into a, a shop window and you see abundance of goods there. Oh, you don't even need to go and buy them. You just appreciate. You go past a flower shop and you see abundance of plants and flowers and you appreciate, you give, you appreciate and, you, and you feel you feel abundant already. Uh, but the deepest abundance is the feeling of the fullness of life. And then I believe what the question is asking at times when he looks at his bank statement, the sense of lack comes back because then you see, oh, uh, I, I have very little, there's not much left. And then uh, the mind will start uh, creating a narrative of lack and will, will tell you that you've been wrong, that, that actually you don't, you don't have much. And that can be uh, a great hindrance in, uh, it will diminish your power of manifestation. So what do you do? when you look at your bank statement or you go to the ATM machine and you want to get out $300 or whatever it is, and it says, you put it in, it says insufficient funds. <laughs> and that's the time of, uh, I'm not talking about right now what you, what can you what you can do on a practical level? The, the question is, uh, as much as possible, uh, do not succumb to the feeling of financial lack, even if there is 
financial lack in your life. Do not succumb to the feeling of lack. And uh, that is uh, whatever you can do to generate a sense of abundance. And the main thing, of course, is going within and sensing the fullness of life. Even when you look at your bank statement, you look at, okay, that's what I don't personalize it. Uh, don't have, have any kind of projection. Just, this is just factually, these are the figures of what I have. And then perhaps you have a certain course of action in order to, in addition to feeling the sense of abundance, uh, you may have to work out a, a certain goal that you have that may give you more abundance. So you, perhaps you have a, uh, something that you want to do to create more abundance. And then your manifestation can flow into that so that the, the sense of abundance flows into the, whatever it is that you are uh, ma um, wanting to manifest in your life. You have to combine action and uh, whatever technique you use or whatever method you use in relation. It is to be recommended that you combine it with some kind of action you know, so that you can uh, generate uh, abundance even on this outer level. So I, this applies in many cases, people have, um, let's say, you might feel a sense of lack of uh, something meaningful in your life, or you might feel a sense of lack of feeling that you are not in, you are not good enough. You are not enough in this world. And some people then come up with, "What is it that I want?" <clears throat> and the ego sir, might say, <clears throat> "In many young people, you have that." The ego might say, I want to be a famous this or that. I want to be, if you ask young people, say, because they're always online and doing things in the virtual world, I want to be a famous YouTuber. I want to be a famous, in okay, now what? Um, let's say somebody says, I want to be a famous YouTuber. That is not good. That is not enough. You can you can you can sit down and then you imagine I am a famous YouTuber and even if you if you feel feel the power of beingness there's still something missing <laughs> and and the, what is missing is in the dimension of doing let's say you have let's say you have the dimension of being you are rooted in the being and you feel the fullness of life and then you say. Okay, I am a finance, I, I am a, a an influential and famous YouTuber. I am an influential. But what are you doing? Do you have anything to convey to people on, on YouTube? Do, is there anything that you are enthusiastic about? Is there anything that you know, people would love to hear from you, or that people would find helpful? That is an, an, this. It's not enough. The foundation, yes, the foundation is to be rooted in the dimension of, of being, so that the sense of fullness of life within you here and now. But then for, sex, for, for many things, maybe not for all things, but for many things, you need to, to also address the dimension of doing. You have the being dimension, but that's the foundation. The doing dimension is, Okay, let's come back to the famous, I want to be a famous YouTuber. Do you have something that you feel enthusiastic about that perhaps other people would appreciate it would help them? What could, what could it be? Is it music or singing or information? 
conveying information or entertaining, whatever it is. Uh, and then you focus on that, develop technical skills because putting things on YouTube, read skills of editing and cameras, producing videos and, uh, and enjoy the doing of it. When, when, when you're engaged in the doing of it, the, this enjoyment of being flows into the doing. And again, you're not, ex don't, do, do not be attached too much to the outcome. That's very important, but enjoy the doing of it so that the being flows into the being dimension, flows into the doing dimension too. So you enjoy learn, learning how to produce videos, learning editing, video editing, learning, and then whatever subject matter you have that you feel enthusiastic about that would help the world and other people, other people, then you, you learn more about it or you go more deeply into it. And then you begin to practice and it's all a wonderful thing. And you're not, a, you're not attached to the outcome, but from time to time, then you're able to, from time to time you go within and you imagine yourself as a famous YouTuber that's reaching hundreds of thousands or millions of people who are being helped or there are, you contribute some, something to other people's lives by doing whatever it is you're doing. And by doing that, you are a famous YouTuber. Then it's more powerful if you feel that this is already the case. It's already, I'm already a famous YouTuber. And perhaps for the time being, you only get uh, 20 views per video, it's, that's fine. That's, at the moment, that's all that, that's fine. But you, in, even that you appreciate those 20 views, great, 20, I've reached 20 people. And then you go within and again, you feel you're already a famous YouTuber and you're helping. It's not just this image of me as a famous YouTuber. There must be another dimension to it that relates to uh, the, the world, how does that affect the world? Whatever you want to achieve, that that can be that, that empowers you. What does? How, how do you help? What does what what does the universe want to manifest through me? When 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 I say universe, I mean the intelligence that pervades the universe, that is behind it all. The uni the universe or the the intelligence behind it all, the divine intelligence behind the phenomenal world. What does it want from me? And maybe it wants me to become a famous YouTuber. But the most important thing is not the famous, it's just what is, what, what is it that the energy that's flowing through me? So in, a, in addition to visualization uh, or affirmation in the, in the being dimension, uh, you may need to address also the doing dimension. And again, bring the two together. Enjoy the doing. Don't use it, don't treat the doing as a stressful thing because you need to achieve this or that. No, you enjoy the doing of it. That's the power, the power of presence has to flow into the doing. The doing is not just a means to an end, it's an end in itself. That, that is very, um, very important realization so that uh, the doing does not become stressful. If stressful, if it's stressful, it means you're excessively attached to the outcome, which means you, you want to be there, but you are here. And that gap between there and here creates stress. And, that's, and then you, uh, uh, as far as manifestation is concerned, it, that is disempowering. 
Now, some people who who, are, who work very hard uh, with that mindset of stress, uh, they ex ex exercise willpower to achieve this. And sometimes they actually do achieve what they will. Occasionally it happens, but it doesn't make them happy. It makes them, when they achieve, they are still unhappy. And in the meantime, anybody else they had, had contact with in whatever work they were doing, they are made unhappy too. So it's, uh, if that is your underlying mindset, I will achieve through sheer willpower. And of course it's stressful. You create stress for yourself, you create unhappiness for yourself and whoever you're in contact with, you make them unhappy too. <laughs> Some companies operate like that. Everybody is stressed and unhappy. <laughs> so if you work in a company like that, my recommendation would be uh, to depart. Uh, so if, if, if your environment is dysfunctional, that can be a, a considerable hindrance to your power manifestation if you're trapped in a dysfunctional environment. <coughs> so, so uh, look out for any sign of stress when you're moving towards your goal and you're active in whatever area look any kind of stress that arises there's something not right if stress arises now this is not to be confused with uh, a kind of uh, feeling a, a, a low energy activity there can be when you engage in something um, meaningful, there's intense energy behind what you do. But this intensity of energy is not stress. Th th there is an enjoyment behind it. Uh, so yes, you may be very intensely engaged, but as you're intensely engaged in whatever it is, Let's say, so let's come back to this person who wants to be a famous YouTuber. <laughs> Just one. Uh, now, at this moment, then he or she is learning how to edit videos, how to do that. Okay. And again, enjoy learning the learning process, trying this out and that, asking questions. What can I do here, there? And then there's the next thing to master. Do you enjoy the doing of that in order uh, rather than? Why am I not a famous YouTuber already? I want to, I need to get there to feel happy. No, you're happy in the doing. And then even if you don't become a famous YouTuber, you'll still be happy. Maybe you reach only a thousand people or 5,000 or 10,000 or 200. And even out of those 200 that you reach, some people may contact you and something else will arise out of that. You can't, many things arise. You have to be always open to new possibilities that you hadn't even thought of. So not everything that you achieve in this life comes through one, wanting to manifest this or that. It's often, it's a good starting point, but sometimes and quite often the best things may come that you never even thought of to manifest. But if you hadn't started with this particular manifestation, the other things that you never thought of would ne never have arisen. <clears throat> so sometimes the universe has, <laughs> uh, so to speak, has, may have greater plans for you than you could even think of. But you have to take the first steps. And sometimes the first steps is, I want to manifest this now and, and then you you practice you go into being rooted in the fullness of being 
then you visualize or you affirm this or that. And in doing that, you feel it's already there in the unseen. And then you, in, in addition, you may have to go into the doing dimension. And in the doing dimension, do, don't lose touch with, the, with being, because if you lose touch with being, you're lost in doing. And you're stressed and you're not effective anymore. And even if you achieve what you wanted to achieve through sheer willpower and hard work and stress, it'll make you unhappy and make others unhappy. So it's pointless. Eckhart, we have a one final question. One final question here. This comes from uh, Nadine in Denmark, who writes, uh, Hi, Eckhart. I'm very concerned about the current state of turmoil and disruption on the planet. And I want to help create what you call the new Earth. What role could conscious manifestation play? Right. Yes. Yes, many people uh, have this concern, not surprisingly. We are in an area of upheavals on our planet. increasing upheavals. So be prepared for more things to come. The greatest contribution you can make is your state of consciousness because the upheavals are mostly co uh, caused by certain dysfunctions in the collective human consciousness. There is something in the human consciousness that creates suffering for other humans. It's been there for a long, long time. This is not the first time. Sometimes the world is, uh, the moments when it's not so, there have always been some areas in the, on the planet where th things are, uh, there's violence and dysfunction more than other parts. But then there are time periods when many parts of the planet become affected by uh, upheavals, human suffering inflicted by other humans. Um, the greatest enemy of humanity is the human mind, obviously, because it's humans who, who kill hundreds of thousands of other humans, or millions in the 20th century, countless millions, 30, 40, nobody knows the exact number. Uh, so the greatest danger for humanity is there's something, there's a certain dysfunction in the human mind. And that manifests in the world. Most of the things you hear about when you listen to the news or you watch the news are manifestations, yes, manifestations of the unconsciousness of humanity. And when I say unconsciousness, I mean, uh, lack of awareness, ego, unconsciousness, complete identification with the conditioned mind. And when you watch the news, almost all of it is manifestations of, of the most extreme forms of unconsciousness happening on the planet. The dysfunction in the human mind 
that all the spiritual traditions have spoken of. There's something not right. There's something wonderful in the human consciousness and the potentials are enormous. And they have, humans have created wonderful things too. But there is an element of insanity that all humans inherit in the collect from the collective. If you doubt that, listen to the, watch the news tonight. If you doubt that, read a book on history, 20th century history, good place to start. Uh, and, and then you see that this, there is a, what we could call a mental illness in the collective consciousness of humanity that creates that suffering. Mental illness is one way of looking at it. And it's, at times, it, it, uh, uh, the mental illness becomes more acute. At other times, it's more latent in the background. And at other times, the, the, this mental illness uh, uh, becomes, comes into the foreground and creates an enormous amount of human suffering. So whatever world humans create inevitably must be a manifestation of the collective consciousness of humanity. It comes out of the collective consciousness of humanity. And in this case, better say the collective unconsciousness of humanity. Your greatest contribution is your state of consciousness so that the whatever you, the unconsciousness that you see around you, so th it does not draw you down into unconsciousness also. Are you able to remain conscious? Uh, which means do not, are you able not to succumb to either anger or fear? These are two important things that I've observed many humans succumb to easily when they engage with the news and so on, either anger or fear. And if that is the case, then be, be aware of that. And uh, it seems natural almost on a purely human level that one should feel anger or fear. There's a third thing that you could feel is compassion for human suffering and that is beautiful and wonderful and uh, the question arises is there anything I can do and whether you are in a position to alleviate human suffering on a practical level I don't know some humans are in a position but in many cases, you may say, well, it's horrible, but I do, there's nothing I can do about it. I, can, I only see it, I watch it. What can I do? Don't underestimate the importance of your state of consciousness because your state of consciousness is connected to the totality of humanity on an unseen level. Don't underestimate the importance of staying conscious and present as you observe the suffering around you. Yes, compassion may arise, sadness may arise, but stay conscious and present and realize that what you are witnessing is a manifestation of where humanity is at present on its evolutionary path where it is at present and uh, the suffering is part of the evolution of consciousness and part of the the egoic consciousness that is uh, is approaching its uh, its end the egoic consciousness in humanity has been prevalent for thousands of years. And now 
the conflicts that are arising now, which are going to be even more serious than what we are witnessing right now, uh, are the final manifestations of the egoic consciousness. What you what you are witnessing, on one level, yes, we need to recognize that the deep dysfunction, the deep unconsciousness that, that makes human do these things, uh, then seemingly many unconscious human beings get killed, suffer. We need to recognize the madness of it. That's important. Uh, but as you become very present, uh, you may begin to realize there is another level of truth. There are levels of truth. On one level of truth, what we are witnessing is dreadful and it needs to be recognized as such. On another level of truth, what we are witnessing is a certain events that are part of the evolutionary paths of humanity. If you consider that a human being uh, is a array of consciousness that assumes a particular physical form, the essence of who you are, what you are is consciousness, a ray of the one consciousness, like a ray of sunlight, one could say. We could say a spark of consciousness. Uh, that remains even when the body dies, the essence of what you are, this particular ray is still there, is not. So there is, a, is an aspect to a human being that, is, that does not is not subject to, to death, only the physical dies. And that uh, the, the, the consciousness that's behind the physical form, whether you call it soul or the divine spark or the ray of consciousness, uh, that goes on. Uh, so every human uh, is part of the evolution of human consciousness and goes on to another lifetime, another, another, another lesson to be learned, another incarnation, uh, unless they no longer need to reincarnate, in which case he would go on to uh, other dimensions of where evolu evolution continues there too. Uh, only the body dies. And that's a liberating thing to realize. You need to realize it for yourself too, otherwise you will be ex very afraid of death. Uh, death is all around you, but death is particularly awful to witness when, it's when it is violent death happening to children young people but if you realize that there is the, the there's an essence in every human being behind the physical manifestation that is not subject to death then uh, from that higher perspective what we are witnessing is a kind of nightmare that humans can awaken out of so we are witnessing a nightmare. For many humans, their life has become a nightmare. And so we are witnessing a nightmare that's happening for many humans. And what happens is a nightmare is a dreamlike state, state of unconscious. Eventually, when you're trapped in a nightmare, a point comes when you awaken out of the nightmare. And then you look back and said, that was horrible. That was a terrible nightmare. So 
at some point, the human being can, uh, you evolve out of that. And, and every human that leaves, if you leave their body, uh, you will find that you look back and say, what that was, that was a terrible dream. This lifetime was a, was a terrible dream. Uh, <clears throat> And then there's a collective dream of humanity, with collective suffering, a terrible nightmare. Because what's happening, part of the evolution of consciousness is the awakening of human consciousness. The, the, the key term is awakening. That's the whole purpose of us being here, is to, is to wit, not to witness, but to embody, to be part of the awakening of human consciousness. Now, what does that imply? It implies that be before it awakens, it's asleep. It's in a dreamlike state. That's the egoic state. And that creates all the suffering that is created by the human ego, the collective ego and the individual ego. Collective ego in the form of a nation or a group of people or the individual, pe individual ego creates enormous suffering, but it's a nightmare it creates a very painful dream. But if within the dream you recognize, so suddenly you recognize something, the, your desire to awaken will become very intense if you're in a nightmare. It will be much more intense than if you're engaged in a pleasant, relatively pleasant dream where well, you're relatively comfortable and things are going okay. And you have your little things that you drink and take and... Uh, but if the dream becomes very unpleasant, becomes a nightmare, your motivation to awaken will, will be much greater. So the awakening of consciousness and the intensification of the nightmare come together. And that is the whole purpose of it. We are witnessing the, truth, the both coming together, the intensification of the nightmare and the awakening of consciousness. The more painful the nightmare becomes, the stronger the motivation to awaken. This is looking at the whole situation from a much higher perspective. And then every human who is engaged in the nightmare, at some point, they awaken. Not perhaps in this lifetime, but at some point, they awaken and they look back and say, oh, that was a nightmare. I'm glad I'm out of it now. That was a horrible nightmare. But if it, if it hadn't been a nightmare, I would still be trapped in a dream. So the, the crisis of humanity that we are experiencing is inseparable from the awakening of human consciousness. They come together. It's, it's only under immense pressure that consciousness evolves. Only under immense pressure does consciousness evolve? That is a function of suffering. Suffering represents that intense pressure under which consciousness evolves. And once it has evolved, the suffering is recognized as a kind of nightmare. It is then transcended and is recognized as a kind of so very similar to a nightmare, a very painful dream. So that's the, the crisis we are going through and it's, we're going, moving into, but uh, is an inseparable part of the awakening of human consciousness. That's, uh, it doesn't mean that we uh, should not help on this on this dimension where wherever we can obviously we do 
it also means that we have compassion for humans that are trapped in their nightmare. It's horrible. I still have memories when I saw the witnessing the destruction in Israel and uh, Palestine and the destruction of buildings and people dying and, and then the other side, terrorists. I, I, I remember um, when I saw the de destroyed buildings when I was a child, I was born uh, three years after the end of a horrible nightmare, collective nightmare that was called the Second World War. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> uh, when I was a child still, because all the cities in Germany had been, most cities had been erased through bombardment. Uh, and I, as a child, my favorite playground was still the ruins of houses that had been bombed. We played in the ruins of houses and um, that the, uh, I remembered that when I watched the ruins of houses in the Palestinian area, I said, oh, that, that's where, I, when I, as a child, I, I was born at the end of this particular nightmare. <laughs> and. It was a natural thing for me. I thought it's normal for almost every every other house was still a ruin, and that that was my playground. <laughs> uh, the so these things have happened already many times before, um, on a much larger scale, even in the twentieth century, on a gigantic scale, and. It, it may get, it, may, it will probably, the situation will most likely deteriorate more in the world in the next few years, but that's perfectly fine. You, it's all part of the evolution of consciousness, but your contribution is vital and your contribution is to stay present and conscious while this is happening. Stay present and conscious while this is happening and uh, do not succumb to fear or anger. They're totally pointless. First of all, anger is totally pointless, obviously. You would all, anger is, and if you act out of anger, you contribute to the unconsciousness. Or fear, fear is uh, not recognizing the essence of who you are as a human being and whoever every other human being, the essence of every other human being as conscious awareness itself, which is not subject to death. So recognize that ultimately you do not die and no human dies, only the body dies. Whether, you, whether that is a belief that you have, but it doesn't need to be just a belief, it is possible to actually experientially realize that dimension in yourself that is the invisible you, which is you, the, most of you is invisible. I mean, nobody can find you by opening up your brain and looking for you. Nobody can find you because the essence of you is invisible. It's not part of this material realm. The essence of you is invisible. The, and I can, I can sense that essence and, and then there's a body that has a limited lifespan. Uh, so then the, the realization of immortality ultimately liberates you, of course, from the fear of death. That, uh, in essence, you cannot die and no human can die, but the that's a wonderful, wonderfully liberating realization. And that's why it has been said in some spirit tradition where it originates, I don't remember, die before you die, which means die to the egoic self, the conceptual identity, the narrative, the mind made, and identification with the physical body, 
die to this and and before you die i physically die die before find death before death finds you is the expression find death before death and finding death happens when uh, we started today with becoming aware of yourself as consciousness and ultimately the person subsides and this person is what dies eventually so when you become aware of yourself as consciousness you find death before death finds you it's only the death of the person the accumulated stuff in the human mind that you identify with is the character that you play in this lifetime the script that you that consciousness plays out when it is not awakened and consciousness is not awakened it plays out a script and that script is the condition entity that, that you call i the person and that is recognized as illusory when you go deeper and you realize even when you let go of that that entity the script the character that that you play unconsciously what remains is the light of consciousness itself totally free of time and not subject to birth and death so jesus talked therefore jesus taught that also he talked about eternal life he said i want the possibility of finding eternal life that's one of his main teachings and eternal does not mean it goes on and on that would be very boring eternal means timeless the the timeless life that is consciousness itself so he talked about he used that expression eternal life it doesn't mean you live forever as this thing but you find the the essence of yourself and in buddhism you have a similar similar term i'm just saying it because they all they all recognize this but they they express it different to use different terminology to express it in buddhism you have the expression um, amara amara is translated as the deathless realm or the deathless dimension the dimension in which there is no death amara mara means is death ah denies it the deathless realm which is a dimension of consciousness that, that you find within yourself jesus talked about it, eternal life which is the same thing expressed in positive terms and buddhism is the same thing expressed in negative terms so jesus says eternal life buddhism says the deathless <laughs> buddhism says everything in negative terms and jesus tends to talk in positive terms pointing to the same reality so you find that then you find death before death finds you and when you find death before death finds you you realize there is no death <laughs> and then you are able to stay present when you contemplate what humans are doing in the state of unconsciousness and then you can say what jesus said on the cross supposed to have said on the cross forgive them for they know not what they do they know not what they do which of course means they are completely unconscious they don't know what they do and when you realize that you forgive them you don't you don't make their unconscious behavior their the behavior they are motivated by unconsciousness into their identity that is the forgiveness when you you recognize unconsciousness being acted out in this world causing suffering but you, you don't you want to make an identity out of it for, for other people you recognize they are displaying behavior that is caused by the present evolution evolutionary state of humanity 
it, 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 on its path towards awakening. So uh, let, that, let that be sufficient for today. I wish you well. Stay present. Stay conscious. Thank you, Eckhart. And thank you, everyone, for being with us. For those of you who are interested in diving even deeper into this topic of conscious manifestation at this time, the most comprehensive offering that Eckhart and Kim have ever created on this topic is coming up. It's called the Spiritual Guide to Conscious Manifestation. And it starts at the end of May in 2024 with a four day in-person retreat in Huntington Beach in California. If you wanna learn more, you can press the learn more button. In a few weeks, we'll also be announcing that there'll be a virtual version that's available. And if you're interested in receiving a scholarship for the virtual version, you can write to support at EckhartTolle.com. Again, that's support at EckhartTolle.com. And I hope to be with many of you at the Spiritual Guide to Conscious Manifestation. And thank you so much, Eckhart, for this fabulous and helpful and deeply instructive Q&A. Thanks, friends.